Welcome back to the Latinx Super Friends. Um, I'm really excited to have Herbert Siguenza here today, who's uh, zooming in from San Diego, which is kind of almost my hometown. Um, I was born in Tijuana, but I grew up in San Diego. My dad went to San Diego State, and uh, uh, and then I moved up to Escondido. So you know, it's sort of like my my early childhood home. So I'm really glad to have Herbert here. Uh, he almost no, needs no introduction, but I, you know, I, I think most of you know him through Culture Clash as being one of the founding members. Uh, he is uh, Salvadorian, is that correct? My, my parents are, yes. I was born in San Francisco. You were born at, woo, San Francisco, go Giants. And then, um, uh, but he's also a solo performer, and uh, we've crossed paths a few times on, on Chavez Ravine and on, uh, I think it was the Cantinflas project. Right, my first solo show, yeah. To St. Anne's, I believe. Yes. And then, uh, and then. Age managed, uh, I think. Right. But, you know, I, I've been following the work for many, many years. Uh, some, someday somebody's got to write a book about y'all. So if anybody has the resources or works at university to do that, get in touch with Herbert after this. Um, thank you for coming. And I, I do just want to start out with a few words about um, what's been going on. And I hope that you are all taking care of yourselves in this, in this pivotal moment. Um, I, I am going to acknowledge that, that this, this, this space is for all of you, that we acknowledge that Black Lives Matter that we seek justice uh, against police brutality, against the, the individuals who have been harmed and killed by police in our cities, in our communities. Um, and, I, and I just wanna offer just for all of you to, uh, to take this opportunity to, to find solace in the work that we're doing. And if you're, if you're inspired to write and inspire to act, which is one of the greatest things you can do with your pen, with your laptop, uh, to speak out. This is what we were, this is why we started this. So thank you for being here. Uh, let's continue to combat anti-Blackness in our communities, especially the Latinx community. And, and if you can, um, you know, we have, you know, just some thoughts about uh, just some suggestions I have, which is to read up about anti-Blackness in Latinx communities, to support policy changes that could help combat structural racism and policing, to um, bring visibility to Black Latinx in your lives, uh, whether uh, they're colleagues in the theater or, or elsewhere in your communities, support organizations and activists that fight anti-Blackness. And the last thing, and I think it's the most important thing, is educate your family members about African roots in Latin America. Uh, I can't say enough about being so much uh, advanced, so much uh, more advanced in my age, finding out about how slave trading happened through Veracruz, Mexico, and through South America. And the, the slave trade not on, just didn't just happen in the Americas and the Caribbean. It happened all at, up and down the hemispheric Latin American uh, continent. So read up on that if you can. Uh, and that's all I have to say. But and I want to, um, if you have any other questions, you can always reach out to me via my email, which is what I sent the link to. But I want to give Herbert the time and the opportunity to share his knowledge with you, because I really think that uh, he has seen and done so much. And we only have an hour. So I want to hand it off to him. Thank you, Herbert, for being here. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. How about we all take a deep breath real quick. And let it out. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you're feeling it, but I'm feeling, you know, as an artist, I'm feeling agitated, you know, emotional. But um, I think, you know, as storytellers, as artists, this is where we have to shine. This is where we have to start writing our stories and um, expressing ourselves, you know, otherwise we go crazy. And that's what I, and that's why I'm here. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dinosaur compared to you guys, you know, I'm, I'm 61. 
I've been doing theater since 1980. So I was already in my 20, um, early 19 or something. Uh, I started with a group called El Teatro Gusto in San Francisco. Uh, we did plays in Spanish. And it was also the first Latino gay, I think, the first Latino gay uh, group. I, even though I was straight, I was in this group <laughs> called Teatro Gusto. And uh, we did plays in Spanish mainly. And then in 1984, Rene Yanez from Galeria La Raza uh, had this crazy idea to put together um, a comedy show, a comedy fiesta for Cinco de Mayo, you know? And, you know, nobody, nobody had heard of Chicano comedy at the time. You know, we had Paul Rodriguez on, on TV and that was about it. And, uh, you know, that was a kind of a disaster. But, <laughs> but uh, Rene had this vision of putting, you know, doing a comedy night and inside a 50 seat art, gal art gallery in San Francisco's Mission District, we formed Comedy Fiesta. And it was me, Richard Montoya, Marga Gomez, you might know, Monica Palacios, and uh, Jose Antonio Burciaga, the late poet. And we did this, you know, we did a, a night of stand up theater, a stand up comedy, and, and it was just uh, life changing for everybody, for us and for the audience, because nobody had heard this type of comedy, which was, a, you know, about Chicanos, you know, about urban bilingual Chicanos that lived in the city, but were culturally now assimilated, you know, and um, we weren't, you know, we weren't doing Teatro Campesino. Teatro Campesino was talking about the, the struggles in the fields, which was great, which was necessary. We were now talking about the neurosis we felt <laughs> being outside the fields, and now we were in a white man's world in a white man's university, right? And so uh, I think that's why Culture Clash struck a nerve early in the 80s because we were the only ones talking about this bi biculturalness and this the bilingualness of our existence, you know? And, um, and then we moved to LA in 1990 and we are, you know, and uh, we went, we had a really, we had two great runs at Los Angeles Theater Center. First, uh, The Mission, which is the first play we wrote, which I'll talk about, and A Bowl of Beans really got us on the map. Um, and we were, we were discovered by, you know, Hollywood and we were discovered by PBS. And also the regional theaters came sniffing around. And, uh, you know, by the mid, by 1993, we were now performing at the regionals. We were now performing in white spaces, you know? We weren't fringe anymore. We were now, um, we were now uh, playing at white spaces, sometimes with, in the beginning with Chicano directors. And then later we started hiring uh, and collaborating with white directors and white dramaturgs, much to Todd Luck's chagrin, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm here to tell you is that I have a lot of knowledge, obviously. There's, we've, been, um, we've been highly successful in the regionals. Um, we haven't looked back since 93. I mean, once, once you're in the game, you wanna stay in the game, of course. And in order to stay in the game, you have to you know, reinvent yourself every five or 10 years in order to, you can't be writing the same stuff all the time. You, know? you have to start reinventing yourself and write about stuff that you don't know about anymore. Um, so we're gonna talk about five different ways of, of writing, of creating material. I'm, I'm the kind of writer that doesn't, I don't write every day, you know? I don't, um, I don't use these methods that, that have been really great, you know, where you, know, you open a portal and you write about a handkerchief that's in Argentina in you know surreal you know magic realism I'm, I don't I don't write that way I'm very practical I'm very pragmatic I'm very organized and that's what I'm going to teach you today how to organize all your thoughts how to uh, outline a play so that it's so ready to write that you probably will write it in a weekend and that's what really happens with me I I accumulate stuff for months all the knowledge that I need in order to write a play and map it out so that when I go away for a weekend, I come back with a play that's all organized, all, you know, ready, not ready to perform, not ready to produce, but certainly ready to read and workshop and, and get it ready for people to look at, seriously look at, you know, and, and give me notes.
you know. So we're going to be talking about writing what you know, um, the modular model. The modular model is uh, very important. I think that was how Bola Beans, a lot of the early culture clash stuff started where they weren't plays necessarily. They were, you know, they were, um, and, and I wouldn't call them sketches either. They're just, they're just modular, modular in tone. We'll talk about all this. We're also gonna talk about uh, if we have all time, you know, uh, we also for many years did interview based uh, theater, spite, site specific plays that started in Miami. Uh, then later on, we did that for many years and got very famous with that. And then later, later we started adapting classics. We started with Aristophanes because we felt that, and, we, and believe me, we didn't know this, you know, one thing I got to tell you guys is that culture clash, we're in an anomaly. We're a totally anomaly. We are the most uneducated uh, <laughs> uh, people, you know, theater artists that you know. We, we don't have formal degrees in theater like a lot of you guys do, you know. We came out of a time where we just did it, you know. We just had to do it out of necessity, you know. So we're very uh, non-academic, which is probably good because that gave us the style that is known as culture clash style, you know, which is a, which is a, which is everything in the kitchen sink, you know, and if it works, it works, but I'm just saying it's very non-traditional in that sense. We're fiercely independent. Um, we really have no, we didn't, we didn't come out of a clique. In other words, we're not, we didn't have writing mentors like uh, Fornes, you know, and, and all these, you know, we, we, we're not part of that, of any of those cliques. We formed, we were, we're very independent and we formed our own, our own style without any academic or traditional influences whatsoever. Uh, really, the, our influences were pop culture, TV, you know, films. Those were our influences, really. And of course, Teatro Campesino, Luis Valdez was always, always, always the foundation of where we came from because we all worked with Luis Valdez at one point or another in our careers. So he's in a sense the, our mentor. Um, then later, we're gonna talk about the dreaded two act structure. Now these are all things, again, when I say I, I wasn't educated, but after, if you wanna stay in the game, you better get your education together, right? So I, I, re I'm really, I really came in late, late, you know, I started studying the classics, Shakespeare, all this stuff much later, you know, only maybe 10, 15 years ago, I really started examining the classics again and, and seeing what, what was so important about them. Why are they, why do they get reproduced all the time, you know? And a lot of it to, has to do with the structure. The two act structure is very, very important that I know now, now that I'm a playwright, now that I'm a playwright, that it's a structure that you that that ev almost everything you see on TV, almost everything you see on TV, almost everything you see on movies has follows that structure. You know, so you know, this is just the way it is. And if you want to get fancy, if you want to get artistic and 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 all that, then then welcome to the fringe, you know. But if you want to seriously get produced, you're gonna have to follow that structure. Um, and then later, I'm going to talk about solo bio biographical work. I'm really proud of a piece called A Weekend with Pablo Picasso, where I, uh, I act and, and paint in it. Because a lot of people don't know this, but I'm, uh, I have a degree in art, and I taught art for many years in, in Oakland, California. Uh, so acting was really, was really a, you know, a, 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 a hobby that became a career. I really wanted to be a visual artist first. So a weekend with Pablo Picasso was a was a great play for me to combine all my talents together. So, so I'm really looking forward to. to I might share a monologue with you later about that. <laughs> so um, let's go back. If you're a new writer, yeah. If you're a new writer, you got to write what you know. You know, if you're a dreamer, write about being a dreamer. You know, if you're second generation, write about that. Write about what you know right now. I, I, I think, and, and that'll get you through maybe one or two plays for sure. You know, you have enough material, enough 
you've lived enough life where you could probably write about what you really know, you know, and what you're passionate about. Um, and we did that. Even, even though we were uneducated, um, Culture Clash, we did that. Our first play was called The Mission. And little did we know, and it was a compilation of different sketches that we had, but we formed the play, you know, we wanted to get reviewed. And so we formed, we wrote this play called The Mission. And we didn't know at the time that we wrote a real good two act structure play, you know? And it was basically three out of town, I mean, three out of uh, work actors, culture clash, you know, we play ourselves. We are so uh, frustrated that we don't get um, cast in the regionals, which was true, that we, uh, we, we form a band, well, not a band, but we, we, we form a group and we kidnap Julio Iglesias. <laughs> we kidnap Julio Iglesias in order to get on national TV. So, you know, this was, you know, totally silly, but it, it, it really worked out. It really worked, it, the, 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 the play really got us uh, noticed because it had a real clear story, you know? And it, and it used us as the protagonist. So when you write your first story, yeah, you can use yourself or somebody like you, an avatar, you know, of, of yourself in order to tell the story. That can be the protagonist, for example, you know? I think uh, Josefina Lopez's um, Real Women Have Curves is an excellent, excellent first play or second play in this case because she's basically writing about herself and her relationship about, with her mother and her community, right? So that's why it's so successful and it keeps getting uh, produced again because it, it really, it's, it's a perfect kind of, you know, what I know play. Now, um, another way of, another way of, of the way I start a play if I don't know what, I, if it's not, you know, what I'm trying to say is a lot of the plays that you're gonna be writing after you write what you know are things and subjects that you have not much, that you don't know much about, you know? When I didn't know much about Chavez Ravine, for example, when uh, Gordon Davidson says, hey, uh, would you like to write, you guys write about a play about the Dodgers coming to LA? We said, sure, but, and, you know, we didn't really know about Chavez Ravine. We knew that some Mexicans were kicked out in order to make uh, room for the stadium, but we really didn't know all the specifics. So what I do, what, we, what I do personally is I, I compile a database of knowledge that helps me write the play later on. It's a database of ideas that all relate under one, one subject. So Thea, can you um, bring up the slide that says immigration story? Yeah, of course. Here, let me pull up. There we go. You guys seeing that all right? Yeah. So this is this is just a basic. Um, this is how I. This is the modular system, and this system works good if you're going to write a modular play or if you're gonna write a traditional two act structure because you're gonna need all these things to interact with each other at one point or another. The main story here is an immigration story. See that in the red? That's, that's what the story's about, okay? Uh, we're gonna keep everything real general right now. You can be more specific, but this is, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna write about an immigrant story. Now on the right of that, you'll see the immigrant, right? The immigrant is my protagonist, for example. We're gonna follow their story. Now, where is, now you have to ask yourself questions. Where is this immigrant from? How old is he or she? Do they have children? For example, and, and, that, and that creates another circle inside that, inside that circle. In other words, if that immigrant is Guatemalan, right? Well, then just don't say, then you, have to, then you have to do research about Guatemala. You should know everything possible about Guatemala, the history, you know, what's the capital, Guatemala City, what's the national bird, the Quetzal. Guess what? The Quetzal dies if it's in cage. It's a bird that literally dies when it's in cage. So isn't that a nice, you know, isn't that a nice connection, right? So in other words, if you do research on Guatemala, 
a lot of the Guatemala history is going to maybe help, is definitely going to help um, flesh out the character, right? Um, so that's, you know, that's one way of looking at it. And then, and then of course, the immigrant comes to, comes to the United States, that journey, that might be another, that might be another uh, bubble, you know, the, the journey itself. In other words, going through Mexico and all that, that's a whole nother uh, can of worms. But let's say this, um, let's say this immigrant gets caught, gets caught crossing over. So now you have to figure out, okay, now you have a whole government ICE thing. You have to learn about how that, how the government works, how ICE works. What is the history of ICE? You know, how long have we been deporting people? You know, what is the, uh, what is the wetback, uh, 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 you know, um, what was that called the, the, you know, when they, uh, well, they set back Mexicans in, in the, in, after the war, you know? Um, so th there's a whole history of, of government and ICE, right? And immigration in general. So that's really important to know. And then later in the play, you can have a support, you can have somebody that supports the immigrant. Well, then you have to find something that, you know, somebody who has, who's a, maybe an attorney, an immigrant rights attorney, maybe somebody who's an activist. So all, you know, and if, if it's an activist, then you have to go out and do some research and see what, how do they do it? How do they defend people that uh, come in undocumented, right? And then the conclusion, well, uh, the conclusion, oh, where I should have started, actually, I should have started with past history. I'm sorry. Past history would have been the first one. Um, if you want to talk about immigration, you have to know in the, all the, yeah, the Operation Wetback. You have to know about the history of immigration. And, and it probably starts with the, uh, it probably starts with the Mexican-American War, right? That's when uh, America took uh, one third of Mexico's land and created a border, right? And so you need to know these things because all these things are going to feed, are going to be the soil. They're going to be the soil of your play. And then, and then you have to come up with a conclusion. What happens to this immigrant? Does he get out? Does he get deported back? That's up to you. That's create, That's really up to you. But you see that you needed all these real practical uh, knowledge in order to write this story. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thea. First. So now, a lot um, of this, uh, Herbert, is like research, but it's not, you're, you're not trying to write a history play. You're, you're, you're using that information to inspire. No, I'm not, yeah, you're going to be, no, you, yeah, this is, but I just feel like the history and all this real hard facts are going to give your creative writing a lot more weight. Yeah, I'm not, ta I'm not talking about creative writing here. I'm just talking about real nuts and bolts data that you're going to need that gives everything you say uh, validity, right? And authenticity because you know your shit. You've done your research, you know what I'm saying? Um, a bowl of beans was a, was a great, uh, once we wrote what we, you know, bowl of beans was about Chicanismo. We'll get into that model. But um, if, you're a, if, if you're a new writer, if you're a poet, if you're a musician, maybe a two act structure play is not the way to go for you. You know, I recommend the modular system where you're able to put different tones, different things, different themes, uh, different, different, yeah, different tones into one play under one umbrella, you know? So let, let's, let, I love, I love what uh, Tazaki Shange says. Let's bring up that, uh, that slide. Yeah, of course. And this is perfect for poets and people that are, you know. Yeah, as a poet in the American theater, I find most activity that takes place on our stage overwhelmingly shallow, stilted, and imitative. That is probably one of the reasons I insist on calling myself a poet or writer rather than a playwright. I am interested solely in the poetry of a moment, the emotional and aesthetic impact of a character or a line. For too long now, Afro-Americans in theater have been duped by the same artificial aesthetics that plague our white counterparts. 
the perfect play, as we know it to be, a truly European framework for European psychology cannot function efficiently for those of us from this hemisphere. So I think we can uh, snap on that one, right? Uh, we can go back, Thea. So this notion okay. of the perfect play, the two act structure, all this, it's a European concept. It is a Eurocentric concept. But guess what, folks? We live in a Eurocentric society. So here we are. But that doesn't mean you as a writer have to stick to those norms. You know, there are very successful modular plays like, uh, like her play, like Bola Beans, like, uh, you know, uh, Huey P. Newton. A lot of, a lot of different, you know, a lot of different plays have reached, you know, success, even though they did not follow that structure. Let's bring up the, I'm sure you guys are, uh, are familiar with a bowl of beans. If you're not, shame on you, but let's bring up, <laughs> let's bring up the bowl of beans idea bubble. So a bowl of beans is about Chicanismo, right? And that's a big, big subject, right? Where do you start? Well, first, we started by using ourselves as the protagonists, culture clash, three Chicanos, right? Three Chicanos on a journey to find out what Chicanismo means in, 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 the in uh, 1992, in this case. Um, the first sketch, the first sketch starts with Columbus. Why Columbus? Well, because that's when, in a sense, America's, you know, the, you know, when Chicano started, in other words, our journey starts there when the Europeans came to America and mixed with the natives, with the Native Americans. And that's really the first Chicanos, right? So we have this sketch, it, we, we made this sketch that's almost like the Godfather where, where uh, Columbus comes to America and he has a bastard son, the first Chicano, right? <laughs> and uh, so we start with that. Now, let me make something really clear. All our plays, almost all of my plays have history in them. I think history is very, very important for many reasons because everything that's happening now, even the riots that are happening now, right now, is because of history. And it all, and it all goes back to colonialism. Everything, almost everything, every problem in the, in the world right now stems back to colonialism. From the 1400s to the 1900s, white people went crazy. The, the, the English, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the Dutch, they conquered half of the world, right? They conquered the Southern hemisphere of the world, you know, exploited the resources, changed the religions, changed their language, all, all kinds of sh crazy shit. And then the Americans jumped into the colonial imperialistic thing in the 1900s, right? And so for 500 years, colonialism has, was among us. And then just recently, just recently have the chains been broken. And of course, this is the mess that we're in, right? All this hurt, all this collective hurt is coming out now. You know, slavery is now, the, the, the memory of slavery is now biting us in the ass, right? And that's what's happening out there on the streets right now. You know, uh, the, the, the immigration is not a problem. That's a problem that happened many years ago when, when the United States took Mexico, you know? So, you know, say, so all this is very, uh, very important history. So um, then we get personal in Bola Beans where Rick, Rick was uh, almost, uh, he was almost killed in San Francisco. Uh, he was shot by a gang member in, in San Francisco, just just out right outside his uh, doorway. And so he talks about La Muerte and how La Muerte is part of our culture, right? How, how what, what a fine line it is, right? So that's, we felt that that was important. And then one of our most, probably the most famous sketches ever is called The Return of Che Guevara, you know? Because Chicanos, you know, we're all about Che and about the revolution, right? 1992. But who really is going to go out there with a gun and, and confront the system? No way, right? You're a dead man. 
And so this Chicano brings back Che Guevara from the dead. And Che Guevara is like ready to come, you know, he's like, okay, let's do it. Where, where, you know, where are the troops? Where are the guns? He says, I'm sorry, you know, what happened to the party? Well, the party's over, Holmes, you know, there was no communist party, you know, the basically the right wing had had, you know, basically the left was was dead, right? The left was dead by the 90s. And that's what our, our that's what our common was, you know. And so Chicanismo was really, uh, you know, really barking up the wrong tea, tree as you, as far as we're concerned. And then uh, Richard had a uh, Richard had his own monologue, uh, where confused and full of rage was was the motto of that uh, monologue, where it's basically a modern day Chicano just raving about being Chicano in the United States, you know, and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful aria. <laughs> And that lasts like 20 minutes. And so that's in the play. And then we end the play with Stand and Deliver Pizza. Now, Stand and Deliver was a very popular film in the 90s, late 80s. And so we spoofed it and we adapted it and made it ours. And, you know, it was another way of, of spoofing our culture and also making a political point. So a Bowl of Beans was a modular play, but it was all under the guise, it was all under the umbrella of Chicanismo. Okay, Tia. Okay. I'm going fast here, guys, but we got to. Yeah. Now, um, why don't we take five minutes? Why don't we take five minutes and you guys come up with your own come up with a, a theme and then see how many circles, you know, see how many other themes that relate to that theme you can make. And you can also make little ones, you know? You can make ones that are the offshoots of this one, you know what I'm saying? Like Guatemala history, you know, or, or slavery, you know, boom, you know? So just have a, just for, just to practice, put, put down, yeah, five minutes. Write down your theme, which is pretty general, and then see what, what comes out of that. <clears throat> What's the history of that theme? Do you want me to start a timer for you? Um, yeah, I have it. You got I, it? Yeah. Right. Cool. And this compilation of data will help you in any kind of play, not just a, a modular play, but even the two act structure that you'll see later, what, how that works. This is just a compilation of, uh, of data.
Two more minutes. I always said that you have to be, you have to be an expert of what you're writing about, you know? One more minute. Thirty seconds. So hopefully doing question and answer, you guys can maybe one of you guys can share one with us. You're good. Uh, let's keep going because we have little time. Um, in the 90s, we started. In the 90s, we saw uh, Anna Devere Smith's play Twilight about the LA riots. And that really impressed us. We really thought, wow, this is cool. This is modular, right? It was all under one theme, the LA riots uprising, but she used different characters, right? Different races in order to tell the story, an overall story. So we went to, uh, we went to Miami and the Miami Light Project commissioned us to write a play about Miami. Now I had no idea, no, I had no idea what, what Miami was about. All I knew is that there was retired Jewish people and there was Cubans, right-wing Cubans. And that was my stereotype of, of Miami, which is not far from the truth. <laughs> but we went deeper and deeper. We, we interviewed Jamaicans, Haitians, uh, activists, uh, you know, Queens and, you know, Queens in, 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 in Miami Beach. I mean, we just, we interviewed like 60, 70 people and transcribed their their interviews, which were like an hour long, and then found, then we tried to find, well, what's the theme about? Well, the theme was Miami, but what was the, what, what, what were the connections? So Thea, can you bring up the, uh, the Radio Mambo idea, please? Got it. Yeah, so Radio Mambo, Culture Clash Invades Miami, um, even though it's, it was a modular play because we had all these different monologues, right? What were we gonna do with them, you know? And so you start fi finding out connections and stuff. So again, we, up on top, we, we cast ourselves as the protagonists, Culture Clash Chicanos going to Miami, not knowing anything about Miami, right? And then when we go to Miami, we, we find out through black academics and black artists and whatnot that Miami was, is a black city. It was founded by African-Americans, you know? And it has this rich history. It had these rich neighborhoods that were decimated after, you know, um, urban sprawl and all that. And after, you know, the freeways and highways cutting through it, much like LA, you know? And so we also interviewed Cubans. You know, we interviewed the Cubans that left uh, left Cuba in the 19, 1959. We wanted to know, well, why did they leave? Why did they come here to the United States? So th those were all very interesting, um, um, you know, stories. And of course, as Chicanos, as political Chicanos, we didn't see eye to eye with them, but, but this was good for us. It was good for us to see a new point of view, a new human point of view, that maybe you're not necessarily agree with, but you have empathy for, you know? Anyone leaving their country for whatever reason, you have to have empathy for, you know? Whether it's, you know, for whatever reasons, right? We also interviewed New Yorkers, retired New Yorkers that went to Miami, and they gave us rich history of, you know, 
of New York and why they came and the gangsters, you know, in Miami Beach and uh, Fred Ross and that, all that history, which is really great, you know. And then we were, we, we were in South Beach and, you know, we, we went around and interviewed the gay culture there, the, you know, the, the, the club culture, did a lot of cocaine and whatnot. And so we put that in the play, you know, we you know, we were honest about our, our, our visit there. And then we interviewed other people, Haitians, Dominicans, uh, uh, you know, J Jamaicans, all these people that rounded off, rounded out, even Mexicans. Uh, that worked were farm workers down in Homestead. They were uh, the orange pickers there, and uh, we interviewed them. So we had all this material, and we were able to uh, construct a play called Culture Clash Invades Miami, which was like a postcard. It didn't have to have, it didn't have like a a, a, a narrative necessarily, right? But it was all under this nice, you know, umbrella that described this town and what it's going through right now. And sometimes that's enough, you know? It doesn't have to necessarily uh, have to make sense in that sense. It makes a lot of sense once you see the whole thing in its entirety, okay? So don't be afraid to write a play like this that has, you know, different tones, different um, themes in it. They can all work hand to hand if it's under one uh, gigantic theme. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Thea. Um, I mean, I could talk about interview base, but basically what we did is we went around and interviewed, I don't know, 40 to 50 people per city and then um, transcribed their, their interviews. And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a nugget, something that's that you want to say, because you know a an, a um, a documentary. It's like documentary theater. In a documentary, it's never it's never uh, subjective. You know, it's always you you're always going to put your you're always going to put your stamp in it. You're always going to edit it the way you want to edit it. You know. So believe me, we edit a lot of stuff out that we weren't, weren't agree with or we didn't like, and we put in the stuff that we did like. Because you're you're the artist, so you're 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 in you're in, you're in the power of editing it in order to say what you want to say, you know. And uh, that's a whole nother class of how to edit it down and how to find five, you know, from one hour interview is fi finding five minutes that are the nuggets, are the gold nuggets of the interview. And sometimes that takes three interviews combined into one to make a character. Sometimes that happens too, you know? But um, the amount of research, the amount of material that you're able to get through interviews is great. I really, uh, I really recommend it for anything you do, you know? When you start doing your research and whatever, you interview people because the way they say things, the way they express themselves is very peculiar. And, and that's, uh, and it gives you, it opens up your ear to listen to people. So, so I really recommend that you do that. I mean, you can go go home tonight and interview your grandparents or somebody, and you'll see that you'll 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 get a whole nother perspective once uh, once you see it on paper. You'll 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 see that it's uh, very powerful. Um, okay, we're already in the forty fourth minute, so let's just talk about two act structure real quick. A lot of you guys went to school, you know about it, so I'm not going to um, bore you about it, but let's let's bring up that two X structure, Thea. Now, from the most unacademic guy, I'm giving you this very academic chart. Don't worry about this chart. All you really have to know that the two X structure is composed of three things. The uh, exposition, where you take off, uh, the conflict is in the middle, and then the resolution at the end. Now, what's really important, the first scene, the first scene is so, so, so important in my, in my mind. If you look at all the classics, if you look at all the plays that keep getting produced again and again, the first scene is probably the longest scene, and it's the most important scene because what you're doing is you're establishing the, the characters, first of all, the main characters, 
You're talking about other characters that you might see later on in the play. Uh, you're talking about, and somewhere along the first 15 pages or so, you, you, better, you better tell us what the hell the play is about. What happens is you cannot end your first act, your first scene, and not tell me what your play is about. <laughs> and then the second half of the play, well, that gets more creative because then that's more, that's the obstacles, you know, those are the, th the things that happen to get, you know, the, the, we know what it's about now, what happens to that plot, you know, there's, there's, there's conflicts, there's this, there's that, there's twists and turns and all that. And then it, it was, and then at, at a certain point, three quarters into the play, that plot, that theme gets really complicated or almost dies, right? And then something happens that brings it back to life and that is the resolution. And in, in a nutshell, that's, what is that? That's Star Wars. That's every, every goddamn film you see has that structure, yeah? Okay, Fia. Yeah. Um, I just wrote a, a play called Bad Hombres, Good Wives. Uh, I think I have five minutes to, to read. I just want to read you the first few pages, and you're going to see how effective a first, a first scene can be and how it can lay out all the cards. Let's bring that up. Hey, Max, are you doing an Ernesto? Can you bring up Max? Can we un unmute Max? Yeah, yeah unmute Max absolutely. Give me one moment. Max is unmuted. Okay, Max, go ahead and, and be our, uh, I'll do Armida, you do Ernesto. All right. Armida, get the door. Armida? Armida, the door, see who's at the door. Okay. I want to stop right there. We haven't even seen this guy and we already know his status, right? We know that he is the patron of the house just by his voice, just by the fact that he's telling somebody else to do something. We haven't even seen him yet. That's called docking a character. Go ahead. Can't you hear the door? Go down, Thea. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is Armida, the, 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 the servant. Oh, I think someone's at the door. And then Don Ernesto opens the door. Okay, um, go ahead, Padre. Padre Alberto, pasale, pasale. Don Ernesto, buenos dias. I, I, I didn't think you were home. I'm sorry I kept you waiting, Padre. I was upstairs getting dressed. Padre Alberto, what a pleasure to see you. Ah, you smell so good. It's Aramis. Can you see it? <laughs> Can, do you see it, Max? Oh, isn't that Padre? Oh, it's Aramis, Armida. I haven't seen you in mass lately. No, I ha no, you haven't. Since we moved to this new apartment. Padre? Padre, she hardly works at all. I don't even know why I hired her as a housekeeper. It's because you feel guilty. Yes, I felt guilty that you lost your hearing when I bombed your boss's car. It's all your fault that I can't hear. Armida, he didn't know you were in the best seat. That's true. Armida? Mm-hmm. Si, sí, mande? Bring us brandies. Si, sí, senor. Here's your mail, Don Ernesto. Gracias, padre. I hope you understand why I have my mail sent to your church instead of here to my apartment. I understand perfectly, Don Ernesto. Yesterday, a DEA officer disguised as a postman came by the church, and you should have seen the look on his face when he realized that Don Ernesto Quesada, head of the largest cartels in the state of Sinaloa, lives in St. Dominique's Catholic Church. <laughs> I hope I make it worth your time, Padre. Thanks to your kind generosity, the orphans have new soccer uniforms. Aquí están. Am I buying my way into heaven? 
you have a VIP suite waiting for you with a bucket of cold coronas. Then Armida enters. Aquí están los brandies. Ah, los brandies. What the hell is this? The candies you wanted. I said brandies, not candies. And how am I supposed to read your mind, eh? Como? Como crees? Keep going up. Sorry. I read lips. I don't know what you're saying unless I see your face and read your lips. Muy bien, Armida. Read my lips. Bring two brandies before I shoot you in the face. Okay, go down. Uh, we're gonna go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of a heart attack, did you hear the news? Don Mario Grande died last night. See that? Game past descanses. Mario Sr. and I go way back. When we were younger, we worked for the Bloody Alliance Cartel. And then we went our own ways, and inevitably, we went to war against each other. Those were bloody years. Those were bloody years. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I lost my... Uh... Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Gracias a Dios, you and Don Mario signed a peace agreement before he died. When is the funeral, Padre? All right. Anyway, we're going to... I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to waste too much time like this. But basically what I want to say, in this first scene, we're, we're establishing who Don Ernesto is, who's, a, who's a, a, a narco guy. The padre is in cahoots with him. Armida is a maid that doesn't listen to him whatsoever, right? And then we find out that the, his arch rival, Mario, has died, and his son is going to take over the, 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 the cartel. We also find out that Don Ernesto has a young woman in a monastery that he's training to be his loyal, subservient wife, the perfect wife, right? And this all happens in the first 15 pages. So you, of course, you know. So by the time the scene ends, we know everything. We know everything that's going to go on. So of course, of course, he's not going to get the subservient, perfect wife that he wants, right? That's the comedy of the whole thing, you know? And, um, and you know, we, and Armida, Armida's a maid that doesn't pay attention to him. So of course she's gonna go against him, right? And uh, later on, we find out that Mario Jr., the, the, the kid who came, who comes to uh, um, overtake his, uh, his father's um, medical uh, office uh, business, falls in love with the young girl that he's been training. So there's gonna be, so the narco war starts, you know? And of course, it gets resolved with two marriages at the end, just like the original, uh, just like uh, like the original Moliere uh, uh, play. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this, is, this is based on uh, this is a riff on a Moliere. Yeah, this is a riff on the Moliere and and how uh, school for wives. Or? In, the importance of being earnest, a little bit of that too. So okay. I took these Eurocentric classic stories and just made it very Mexicano, you know, very novella, and it works, you know. So again, if you're gonna adapt a classic, don't just, just you know, don't just trans, you, you should translate it to your language at first, that's your first draft, but after that, you have to think out of the box and really just, just make it yours. So it doesn't even look like the original anymore, you know? It sounds and it looks totally different. That's okay, Thea. Thank you. But that first scene you're, is what you're, you're docking the characters. Everything they say has to have a consistent, consistent uh, theme. Oh, not theme, but you know the want. The want has got to be consistent. Right. That's the first time I've ever heard that word, docking. Yeah, uh, Mark Bly. Mark Bly, the dramaturg from mm -hmm. uh, from Yale Rep and bunch of and you know bunch of bunch of theaters. He, he's a good friend of mine and he gave me that, that I thought that's a great idea, docking the character. Especially in the first scenes, you wanna be consistent, you know? You know, a character should not say something that is not consistent to their, to their overall journey, you know? And especially in the first scene, you know? Because we're just getting to know a character. So whatever they say has to be very revelatory. Right, don't waste time on the small talk, just. No, don't, don't. You know, small talk is just to get you there. Small talk is just to disguise the expository nature of the play. Mm -hmm. 
position is very boring, of course. It's very obvious. So you're you're um, you're as a writer, what you have to do is disguise the exposition somehow by by make you know by being slick, you know, by hiding it with other stuff, you know. But you're still getting it out there. Mm -hmm. Come out and natural. Do you find that, that that comedy that the subtext is really there's there's no certain there's no subtext because it's like right there on the surface versus drama, which is yes yes and all of that yes i'm you know i'm still right i'm still beginning to write drama you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and, but, but i find you know comedy is my thing is my forte and i just find comedy a lot easier in that sense that there is no subtext it's it's on your sleeve <laughs> well yeah. i want to make sure we get some questions in from yeah the yeah i'm sorry that's okay um thea do you want to moderate Absolutely. We have a hand up here. Viviana, you are unmuted. Ooh, looks like there's a bit of delay. There we go. Hello? Can you hear me? Hi. Thank you so Hi. much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I know I've been doing these workshops and I know you've been doing a couple of them too. Um, a couple of workshops, you said that you see from a lot of young writers that there's a lot of problems problem structurally. And I wanna know like what specifically do like young writers have problems with the structure and how is there a way to specifically get, move away from that problem? Good question. I think a lot has to do with, yeah, and this takes a while, you know, economy. You know, I think a lot of times when we're, you were young, we think, oh, wow, everything I wrote is beautiful. It's great. <laughs> you know, but it is, it is. But guess what? The more you, the more you're into this, the more you write, you're going to learn. And the more you collaborate with other people, you're going to, you're going to kill a lot of babies. You know, you're going to kill a lot of babies. You're going to, you know, if it's, if it's, if it gets in the way, or if it's taking too long to get to what you want, what the story's about, what you want, what the story is, then you probably have to cut it, you know? And it might be beautiful. Believe me, I've cut some beautiful stuff, but guess what? It made the uh, play better because I got to the point. Um, and I'm, but that's my, that's my, uh, but that's my style, you know? My style is I get to the point fast and, and, and move on, you know? Um, people are more lyrical, more poetic. I, I respect that, I love that, you know? But that's not my style. But again, I think I have to go back to the, if the, if in the, in the first 15 minutes, if I don't know what your play is about, then, then something is dreadfully wrong. So much, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't hold back. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Dread Our next question dreadfully is wrong. from Diana. You are unmuted. Yes. Hi, Herbert. Um, so Hi, my question, it, how are you? Um, my question is about your interview techniques. When you are interviewing subjects for um, that kind of work, how do you approach them? What do you What do you find is effective? Um, just if you could speak just a little bit on that, that would be great. Well, we, you know, I mean, sometimes you enter their homes, you know, sometimes you enter their businesses. And so, you know, there has to be a, there has to be trust, you know, there's, they have, you have to be really honest and say, listen, I'm writing a play about this and I want to interview and get your opinion about it, but I don't know, but I'm going to tell you right now, I might use your words. I might not. Um, and if I do use your words, I'm not going to use your name. Right. Um, so if you're comfortable with that, can we proceed? I don't want to, I, I don't come in with a paper, you know, a, a, a legal, uh, you know, release form that just, to me, that just creates red flags right there. You know, um, I, I just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, it's a handshake. Are you, are you cool with that? You know, I might use your words. I might not, because that's the truth. You don't know if you're going to use them or not. And if you do use them, well, they might be another character with another name. Are you okay with that? You know? Is that is that answer what you wanted to know? Okay. We have one uh, more way, question on the list. Uh, yeah. 
Just really quick, by the way, Diana, Diana's play was selected for the San Diego New Play Latinx Festival. Yay. This year. Congratulations. Any this question is from Amanda. You are unmuted. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm still a baby writer. I'm an undergrad. I have some really bad first drafts under my belt because I tend to do the thing where I don't know what I'm writing about. Like I don't know the story completely all the way through or at all really. And, and just, it just happens. Mm -hmm. and, um, so think, cause what, what, what inspires me, the usual moment is like a, a, a character or a relationship or like one tiny interaction or something like that. So what do you think about when you have that kind of inspiration? Where do you go from there to get a story in any of these kind of like, more structured um, plot. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, um, ideas like that come up, you know, uh, dialogue, two people talking about certain thing. Yeah, definitely write that out, you know, write that out. That's, that's you know, make that happen. Uh, definitely make that happen. But yeah, it has to be in context of a story. And that's where, yeah, that's where, that's the hard part. What you have to put that, that discussion or that moment in in some housed under something right so what is it what do you you know what is the theme again it's back to the the general theme what what do you think they're talking about if they're talking about i don't know i'm just saying the what are they talking about what is the overall thematic theme they're talking about and be your central that should be your your middle um circle right and that that dialogue, that that scene that you have is just one part of that bigger, you know, of that bigger play, right? So hopefully that'll help you there, you know. Just come up with the theme, and then you're going to think of other other uh, other scenes that are off that same theme, you know. You know, if it's about family, then you know, yeah, then the sister, the mother, the the history of the family, all that stuff comes into play, you know. And then you'll start seeing that, oh, there's a world here. You're, what you're doing is you're creating a, a bigger world than, the, than that just that little scene that you have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. you. You wanted to see the bubbles. Yeah, anybody want to share a bubble? Wow. That's awesome. I'm not, I'm not going to show because. Wow. Well. Tons, of, tons of little uh, sub bubbles and everything, huh? <laughs> that's awesome Did, was that helpful though that exercise I haven't done that since high school <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's pretty basic but we forget about it you know how, how important it is yeah absolutely uh, any other uh, questions Free to toss them in the chat. Oh, I see one more from Danny. And all these documents are going to be uh, available, right? Yes. Your, your, yeah, your you account. can find and download all of the documents on the HowlRound announcement page after the session, along with a recorded version of this event. Um, Danny, you are unmuted. Yeah, um, I might be opening a can of worms, but what do you do with um, one seen like plays or a one person show where it's like continuous and it's not necessarily breaks and stuff like that but what do you involve in the beginning a middle and an end and stuff like that that's a great great question i think that the rules still kind of apply they're just a little they're just modified a little different because yeah you don't have another character to interact with right mm -hmm. um but still the the rules still apply that you're in the first 10 or 15 minutes, I want to know who you are, right? I want to know what this place is about, what you're going to talk about, and give me some hint of where you're going, you know? Um, and so that when we get there, I go, as an audience, I go, oh, good, he got there, great. You know what I'm saying? He, he, okay, he said he was going to fight the dragon. Here's the dragon. He's fighting it. Great. He told me he was going to do that, and it's happening. It's very satisfactory, you know, mm -hmm. it, when we know something's coming up and it's, it does happen, you know. Now, things happen and you didn't tell us, and that's good too, you know. Surprise, right? 
So, but that's that's tw that's the twisting and turning of the second act, you know, where you give uh, your protagonist surprises, you know, and and hopefully in your solo piece, you know, within an hour or hour and a half, you're you know you there's something that that really is is very dangerous or very that that really just can, can ruin you know the day for that protagonist you know something dreadful will happen or something mm -hmm. be something that's very climatic very uh, dangerous that you get out of somehow you know and then a solution happens so and th those things still apply even for solo shows you know Mm -hmm. Even for solo shows, they have to have some sort of dramatic structure, some sort of uh, of speed, you know, speed to get there. Otherwise, it's just a monologue and it just drags and drags and drags because it doesn't have the structure that we need as an audience to be with you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So, guys, um, Thank you. I mean, these I've been I've been checking in on these too. I love these because again, I'm not I'm not a uh, educated writer, and uh, whatever I, that means. <laughs> I, yeah, whatever that means. And uh, but it just shows you that you don't need necessarily an education to be a writer. It just shows you that you have to go for, just do it. Yeah. Um, but these uh these have been really good. These have been uh, these I've I've gotten a lot out of them too you know yeah it's just like you know this is like you guys this is like grad school this is everybody who sits around in a table and just talks about plays and what to write and how to write and sharing ideas this isn't that this isn't it, it isn't a prescription to like you, you can see that if you've been to all of these sessions that everybody comes in with a very different way of thinking about process and writing and and I'm so glad that you were here, Herbert, to, to share the modules because I haven't thought about modules in a long time. Um, I, uh, it, one of the things that I admire about you is that you, it, you and Culture Clash really push the boundaries about what, 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 what can be said and what can't be said. In, in a, I mean, in a way, like just pushing those boundaries. And I, I'm curious if, um, is there a line that you won't cross in terms of the work that you do? And I'm sure this comes up a lot, like, do I, do I really want to tell that joke that like makes fun of Edward James Olmos or Selena? Like, is it like too far? Because I know that you love those moments where everybody goes, oh, que asco. But is, is there like, a, I'm sure they're like personal lines, but, uh, but in terms yeah, of like, you know, that's that fire, is there a line that you won't cross? It's trial and error, you know, we, uh, sometimes we cross the line and uh, back when we were young, it was like, we crossed the line, oh good, you know, we, well, that means we're doing the right thing. But, you know, as you get older, you're figuring out, no, you know what, that was, that was pretty gacho. We should probably stop do saying that, you know what I'm saying? And right. so, you know. Like Linda Ronstan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't said anything about Linda Ronstan. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think as we, we've gotten older, we've, uh, you know, we just, gotten more respectful as well and you know we don't you know when we were young and brash yeah it was fine but now we don't you know we're, we're a little more careful you know all right so you're basically saying while well, you're young and brash just just say it all right now i think so i think so why not <laughs> diana is going like was, do it we didn't have anything to lose you know we mm -hmm. didn't you know now it's you know you know, reputation, legend, you know, all that shit gets in the way. <laughs> I get it. We are young, we didn't care. Okay. Well, Herbert, keep coming back because, you know, we love having you. Thank you. And speaking of coming back, come back Friday because it's Diana Berbano. Yay. Uh, I have no idea what she's going to do Friday, but I'm sure it'll be awesome. Thank you, guys. So Herbert, thank you so much. We'll we'll yeah. discuss Latinx directors another time. My email is Herbert at gmail.com if you have any questions. Sigwenzaherbert at gmail.com. You heard the man. Bye. Thank, thank you, you, Herb. Thank you for doing.
Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for having me again. <laughs>